I love the movie Hunt for Red October. Uh, even though I know how it ends, I could tell you how it ends. Every time it comes on TV, every time I see it as an option to watch, I just tune in, I just pick up right where the story is. I know the end, but I love the story. And part of the reason I love the story is because I know how it ends. With the popular holiday film, It's a Wonderful Life, um, probably many of us have watched that many times. But we like watching it because we know how it ends and how George recognizes how meaningful his life is, not because he has money, but because he has friends. See, we know the end of the story. And that's what makes it such a beautiful movie. Well, as you relate that principle to our Christian lives, we are given the end of the story. And that's what makes our life so meaningful and what makes gatherings like this so important because we know how all this ends. Or at least we should know how it ends. But sadly, many feel like for their life, they don't know how it's going to end. And in the Christian life is nothing but fear and trepidation and doubt and insecurity. And, and the life shows it. But what we're going to see this morning is the end of the story and how for our lives, our challenge is to push through to absolute victory. Because we know that that is the end of our story. Absolute victory, that's what God intends. In fact, what we are honoring in this season, and especially in these songs this morning, what we do every first day of the week, but especially even with the birth of Christ, that is the beginning of the end. <laughs> that is God securing by sending His Son and His taking on our humanity. That is securing victory for us, the beginning of it, as Christ will eventually become our sacrifice, and our answer, which will secure victory. I want to consider just for a moment how many songs that we sing um, or have sung in the past talk about the theme of war, battle, and victory. Even the song that Nathaniel just led. Oh, come and uh, exalted and victorious. This great a uh, hymn about the birth of Christ exclaims, the beginning, exalted and victorious, and that runs throughout most hymns. <clears throat> Think about some of the oldest hymns. <clears throat> Excuse me. A mighty fortress. A mighty fortress is our God. The idea that we are in this battle or this conflict. I remember growing up singing Onward Christian Soldiers. Remember that song? Onward Christian Soldiers. And those are the songs I liked as a kid. Like boys, I mean, battle and fighting and things like that. I don't know, oh yeah, but, but we do it in a Christian context. But uh, soldiers of Christ arise and put your armor on. Remember that hymn? Stand up, stand up for Jesus. The idea of conquest, the idea of battle, of war. Sound the battle cry, see the foe is nigh. These are songs I grew up on. O oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. Faith is a victory. There's another one where this constant theme of victory, fighting, war, but yet all in this context of Christ being our leader, He is our captain, and He's the one that leads us into glorious victory. Uh, a song that Nathaniel's led at times, Victory uh, Chant, where he begins, Hail Jesus, you're my King. Uh, the title of the song is Victory Chant, where the battle belongs to the Lord. We know that hymn. There's a new song that hopefully we'll sing in the years to come, uh, written by Phil Wickham called Battle Belongs, where he understands as a young songwriter and singer the value of Christian understanding that, that we're not on a cruise in the Christian life. We're not on a cruise trying to arrive at our final destination that God intends. We are in a conflict, but we're in a conflict where we know the end of the story so this morning I want to see the nature of that conflict, and but see how it will end, and to see how that encourages us to stay strong in this battle. First of all, understand this great theme. We are at the end of a war. Don't ever think that they you were baptized, that you were baptized into a comfort zone, or that you were baptized into all your problems being settled right away. Did that ever happen? <laughs> Uh, a lot of people had more problems once they were baptized than they ever had before because all of a sudden now they're trying, they're fighting, 
Uh, they're bothered by things they were comfortable with or taking on problems in their life that they decide, hey, everyone has this problem, don't they? All of a sudden you recognize, hey, I'm in a conflict. Now I have confidence because of Jesus, but you understood when you were baptized that I am now in a war. And I'm going to take on the evil one. Remember in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus said, and deliver us from evil. And the apostolic writers constantly warn us about the evil one. When the day of evil comes, Paul, when he writes, as we'll visit later uh, in Ephesians chapter 6, for our, we, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces in the heavenly places. And then he goes on to pinpoint that Satan is to be, uh, the, the center of that conflict. But understand, as we understand conflict, whether we sing about it in hymns or whether we pray for deliverance against temptation, that we are the, at the end of this war. You might say, well, how so, John? What do you mean we are at the end of a war? Uh, 1 Peter chapter 4. Peter writes in the first century in verse 7, the end of all things is near, he wrote. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind, so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers a multitude of sins. Peter says the end of all things is near. And here he's not writing because he's looking at his watch, but he's looking at the timetable of God. That God has secured something through His Son, and that now brings the return of His Son even closer. And the end of God's purpose, all his plans for people is going to come closer and closer to consummation. So he simply says to believers here, buckle up. Get ready to go. And that is always the presentation of the gospel in the epistles especially. Get ready to go because the end is near. Look at Revelation chapter 12. Go forward to Revelation 12. If you don't have your Bible, you'd rather just kind of listen to the spoken word. Listen closely to how the Apostle John, as God speaks to him, describes the Christian life. Now, there's a lot of very figurative language in the Revelation. There's a lot of imagery. There's the description of Satan and his forces as dragons and things like that. But the whole point is to make a point that we are in this conflict. Of verse 7, John records, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. Just stop there. That's why you have problems. That's why every day is a day of temptation, a day of challenge, a day of your conscience, having to decide right from wrong. Because Satan has been hurled down, and he's now here with us, wreaking havoc, because he was kicked out of heaven for his rebellion. John goes on to write verse 10, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now have come down the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of His Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God, <coughs> excuse me, night and day, has been hurled down. They triumphed. There's victory. They triumphed over Him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Excuse me. Now, therefore rejoice you heaven and you who dwell in them, but woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury. Thank you, Nathaniel. So here again, Satan is down here among us. Let's skip ahead to verse 17. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commands and hold fast to their testimony. Then one more, chapter 13, verse 7. It was given power to make war against God's people and to conquer them. 
This is probably the one section of Scripture that captures uh, powerfully and vividly, even beyond any other, the idea that we are in an eternal conflict. Since the beginning of time, there's been a war waged over you. You are the center of this conflict. Look at Genesis chapter 3. Within 15 minutes of Adam and Eve on the earth, Satan appears and goes right to Eve. Has God said, you cannot eat of the garden or the fruit of this tree? Satan is challenging God's giving to his creation free will. That is giving them the ability to choose right and wrong. To either love God or be lukewarm towards Him or hate Him. God's given us a choice and Satan doesn't believe that was a very good choice on God's part. Because Satan doesn't love you. He doesn't think very well of you. He thinks that you will do bad most of the time and you don't love God and for any time you're doing something good for God, you're only doing it because you can get something out of it. And isn't that what he said to Job when he reappears on the earth? God goes to Job, have you seen my servant Job? There's none like him. But Satan goes on to say, well, you take from him his comfortable lifestyle. You take his car, you take his house, you take his friends, you take his health, he'll curse you to his face. And even Job's wife said, yeah, go ahead and do that. Once it got really bad. Satan doesn't think very well of you. But your God thinks the world of you. And this War that we're in is a war over you. You are the center of God's attention. But you're also the center of Satan's attention. And Satan's trying to ruin everything God's trying to work in you. He wants to turn even giving into, hey, look at me, look, at, look how I sacrifice for others. Satan wants to ruin everything. All because he thinks this idea of giving you free will is a disaster. He's angry about being kicked out from his own rebellion because he wants God's place. So he wants to ruin it here. And he goes after everyone. We see it in Job. We see it in the Garden of Eden. He even went after God's own son, the temptation in the wilderness, Matthew chapter 4. Luke chapter 22. Right before Jesus' own wrestling with whether or not to go through the cross in the Garden of Gethsemane, he goes to Peter. He says, Peter, Satan has asked permission to sift you as wheat. Luke 22, 31. Here, Satan's going after Peter. He's going to go after Jesus. There's no one he doesn't go after. And that is the eternal conflict that we're part of. And if you're fighting today a personal battle in your life with temptation where there's a struggle that you're going through that maybe a lot of people know about or maybe no one knows about. It's because God and Satan are fighting over you. You say, well, I'm not feeling anything. Well, you may be dead. <laughs> if you don't feel any conflict, and, and non-believers, they don't seem to feel a lot of conflict because they're not even trying. They've simply given themselves over to the evil one, and he's moved on. Just like an army, when they see a bunch of dead bodies when they've charged the city, they will move on looking for others. So if you're not feeling any conflict, that's not a good thing. But if you're feeling a lot of conflict every day and a struggle to do the right thing, a good attitude, to deal right with your neighbor, with your spouse, you are in the battle. And that's why there's a struggle. But we're at the end of this war. Because what we're honoring in this season is God sending His Son to be the answer to our problem of sin and death. Because we realize in this struggle, we've lost more battles than we won. Paul explained in the Roman letter, O wretched man that I am, who can deliver me from this body of death? We realize we've lost more battles than we won. That God sent His Son to be the sacrifice to pay for our sins, to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. And that would usher in the end of this war. Because God secures victory through His Son. Our challenge is to finish the battles we have to fight until the end. But this is where you're at in your life. Don't think so much about your age. Don't think about retirement status or, or school status or graduation status or home status. Do you own rent? Don't think about any kind of physical status that really defines you. 
What defines your life is you are at the end of a war that's being fought. And we are closer now to victory than we've ever been. And I want to see how that comes out as we go on. But as we leave this thought, I want you to really understand that don't ever think for one moment that you're not important in your life. You might be lonely at times, might not have the people around you you'd like to have, but don't ever think that no one has their attention upon you. Your Heavenly Father in this great eternal conflict is always watching you. Though it's not really a blessing, Satan's watching you too because he thinks you're important. Because he wants to ruin things. But don't ever think your life is not important. It's important to your God. He's invested everything in you. That you might be with Him one day forever. And He's going to war with Satan over you. That's how valuable you are. But you're at the end of this war and victory is now close. Well, what do we do? What do we do before this victory happens? Understand that battles must still be fought. Understand that battles must still be fought. Um, last Monday night, I saw something uh, with a football game that I'd never seen before concerning the, still hard to say this, the Las Vegas Raiders. We know them as the Oakland Raiders. <laughs> Who said, Muhammad? Austin, if you could take him outside. We don't acknowledge the Los Angeles Raiders. That I'm joking around, but our Raiders, I grew up with the Raiders. Still watch them. They're still in my heart. But they were doing something I've, never seen them, I've not seen them do ever. They were ahead of the L.A. Chargers. That's hard to say, too, because it should be San Diego Chargers. They were ahead at the end of first quarter, 27-0. After losing a 3-0 game the previous week and playing Ahead 27 0, and then by the end of the half, I think they were up 41 0. They were pushing ahead to absolute victory. But they didn't call the game at halftime. They didn't say, Well, it looks like the Raiders are going to win this one. They're ahead 41 0. The Chargers look hapless and not able to do anything. Let's just end the game. They didn't end the game. They still had to what? Continue to play. All the way to the end of the fourth quarter. And that's where you and I are at in this end of the war. As we sing, O victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He secured the victory in the cross. But we still have to fight some battles. We have the third quarter and the fourth quarter still to play and to take very seriously. There's been some pretty powerful comebacks in NFL football, and the Raiders could not afford just to give up. And neither can we. Look again at Revelation 12. Um, our challenge. Verse 17. Then the dragon was enraged against the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commands and hold fast to their testimony. See, Satan knows he's lost. But he's still... He knows his end is going to... Not as leader, not as controller of hell, but he will be the first to go. But he is determined to take what? As many people with him as he can. So he's going to continue to fight till the end, even though he lost at the cross. Jesus secured the victory for us, died for our sin, resurrected the third day, secured victory not only over our sin, but our death, but Satan will not go down without a fight. And the fight is over you. And every other person that proclaims obedience to God. Again, verse 17, Then the dragon was enraged against the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring. Well, who's that? Those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony to Jesus. Satan is at war against those who are trying. Not against those who are living perfectly. His war is not against those who have given up and are just giving in to every temptation. Satan's wars with the strugglers. They get up every morning and fight an addiction. Get up every morning and fight a relational conflict with someone they have to work with. Uh, there's a war going on between 
People sometimes in families, because there's a war over doing the right thing as a husband or a wife, as a child, because all three have responsibilities in the family. There's a war in your teenage years. There's a war in your 50s. There's a war in old age. Of how are you going to use your latter years? To have a bucket list to live it all up for you? Or to use the life that you built up as a blessing to others? Every age period of your life, Spring, summer, winter, fall is a time or a season of battle. And we will not stop fighting until Jesus calls us home. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2, Abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. So our challenge is to always be looking for things that destroy us. Some it might be sexual lust, with others it might be greed, others it's selfishness. Others, it's snobbiness. With others, it's slander and always talking bad about others, gossiping. We all have our conflicts. And just as Jesus knows every one of our weaknesses, so does Satan. And he will push that button every time. When that person comes down the street or when that coworker crosses the hall, he knows how to get at you. He knows what temptations work. He knows what temptations don't. But understand, you've got to fight the battle. The battle's in your mind at times. Your thoughts. The battle's in your heart, which means your devotion, the things that are important to you. The battle's sometimes, again, as I said earlier, with your family. Not that they're the enemy, but he would love to destroy a family. You can get a bunch of people all at once. Your priorities, whether... You love him and love others, or whether or not you love things, or accomplishments, or trophies, or pride, and things like that. Always a struggle. Again, the conflict does not end till your life is over. Remember what, again, Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6, if we leave this point. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God that you may take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. That is, we're not fighting people. But against rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That means you've got a lot of stuff thrown at you. You've got Satan, and he's got his forces working in people that are trying to get at you, or working in circumstances, in pain, in heartbreak, loss, anger. He's going to use every one of your emotions that, and try to turn things against you. That's what he does. So battles still must be fought. And don't ever think that there's going to be time in your Christian life where you've kind of plateaued, where you don't have to fight anymore. It's not going to be old age. You're just going to have a new set of problems. And it's not going to be your teen years. That's where your identity is being shaped. Every year will have struggle. Every moment will have struggle. Don't think that my goal or your goal is to get to the point where you're not fighting anything. But fighting means you're in the battle. You're exactly where God wants you. Temptation is not sin. You're being tempted today. And struggling. Right? And you wonder, how am I... How am I always struggling over this. That's good. Because that means Satan is after you because you're honoring God and God is there to support you. Temptation is not wrong. It's only giving in to temptation, deciding I'd rather do the opposite than what my Creator wants. It becomes wrong. That's sin. But don't let the struggle bother you. Don't think, well, I should have outgrown this. Or I should have this problem down by now. I know what you mean. I mean, we want to think we have measured success. We want to grow, but again, Satan knows those weaknesses. And if they were a problem 10 years ago, he wants to be a problem again. He wants to resurrect the same struggles, the same trials, the same desires that worked 10 years ago. Like in sports, coaches like to go back to plays that worked last year or last week. They even watch what other teams do to figure out what works, and that's what Satan does. So understand these battles must be fought. 
But understand this as well this morning. Victory is your destiny. Amen. Despite whatever you're struggling with, whoever you're struggling with, whatever it is, victory is your destiny. We've looked already at Revelation 12 and 13 about there's a war, but yet it's described in the context of victory. I want to see how the writers God chose to work through, especially the Apostle Paul, described victory. Look at Romans chapter 7, verse 21. One of the most significant scriptures that describe conflict, not with someone that was just baptized a day ago, but with an apostle, someone that wrote 13 letters of the New Testament. He writes in the present tense, verse 21 of chapter 7, So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law, another law at work in me, waging war. There it is. Waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work in me. Verse 24, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Verse 25, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. There it is. As he describes this internal struggle that you and I have as well. He's having it as a apostle. He, just, he says, I have this delight or desire to follow God by seeing myself always doing the opposite. Or most of the time. He says, who will deliver me? Who will rescue me from this body of death? This body that commits more sins than it should. Where's the answer? Is it trying to be good enough? It's too late to be good enough. There's only one answer, and that's Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God, verse 25, who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus is the great deliverance of a hopeless people, starting with me and trickling down to everyone. We have no hope apart from Jesus. And that's why the great songwriters of the past would write, O oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and He bought me with His eternal blood. And this, the idea that someone saved them and it wasn't themselves. I heard an old, old story how a Savior came from glory. Victory is your destiny. We just read about victory over sin. That's our terminal condition, sin. Jesus secured victory by his forgiveness in the cross. But we also have forgiven, or we have a victory over death. Paul also writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he talks about the resurrection. He says, but thanks be to God. He, he's continually thankful. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, oh death, where is your victory? Oh death, where is your sting? Paul writes about the fact that even though we die, we will live again. That when Christ returns, He will bring with Him those who have died already and He will resurrect those who are alive and then all will be taken up to judgment and eventually to glory with this brand new resurrected body to have eternally in heaven. Next to the problem of sin, the problem of death is its twin. Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, all the great inventors of this world have not even come close to this problem. We will be resurrected. And that's why Paul says, But thanks be to God who gives us a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And says, verse 58, Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, this is 1 Corinthians 15, Stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. That's the beauty of the Christian life. Again, we know how the story ends. And that it is a wonderful life despite it being filled with conflict and pain and tears and loss. People leaving our life that we thought would be there forever. Struggles in every stage of our life. We still have 
still know the end of the story. And Paul says, know that your labor is not in vain. Christians know that every moment of their life is worth it. Every decision matters. Their time is important. There's nothing that's wasted. And they know that even though they're growing older and the scene in the mirror changes day by day and month by month, they also know they're that much closer to eternity. They're that much closer to their destiny being realized. Oh, victory in Jesus. Paul said in Colossians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. He says, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. Verse 22. But now He has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in His sight, without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue... If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. There's our challenge. You were baptized. You agreed to join the battle. Uh, forgiveness was secured. Good to see you, Gary. Forgiveness was secured. Victory became yours through Jesus Christ. Our challenge now is to stay the course. To not fall away and abandon everything we have. Not to give in to lukewarmness. And just become a churchgoer instead of a soldier. And to see it through with God till the end. His blood continually cleanses us from sin. Even though we will lose a battle more often than we want. His blood will cleanse us from that sin. If we'll confess that sin, John writes, Acknowledge what God saw and to get right back up and continue fighting. He will continually cleanse us from our sin. And that's why victory is our destiny. Nothing can touch us because of the blood of Christ. If we will yet confess that sin, deal with it, be honest about it with God, and get back up and try. John writes in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 about our faith. He says, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. What's he saying there? Our challenge in this life is we're dealing with unseen things. Satan, we don't see him. We don't see our Heavenly Father, but we have evidence all around us that he exists. Of forgiveness itself. We accept that by faith that God says when we confess our sins or when we're baptized into Christ, we are forgiven. We don't see something. We don't see ourselves turn white or something like that. We have no physical, demonstrable thing to grab onto. We walk by faith and not by sight. Faith means based on the evidence God has given us, whether it be His Word or creation itself, that we know these things to be true, that when God says He forgives us, He does. But that's the challenge. We live in a world of visual things. Things that we can see and touch and feel and we want to give our attention there, but these are things by faith that we hold on to. Forgiveness, hope of the resurrection, prayer that God listens. Our life is lived by faith and that's not easy all the time. We want things to touch. We want to see a vision from God. We, if God could just show up in front of me, we think we'd be a lot stronger. Maybe we would, maybe we wouldn't. But our challenge is to live by faith. And again, John writes, this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. God values your faith in Him because He knows you don't see these things. He knows you can't reach out and touch Him. But you believe in Him. And that matters the world to God. It means everything to Him. Because that's what Satan's challenged. Will these people really follow God when they can't see you? And they, they, they can't always have something physical to touch or, uh, or to make connection to? Will they, will they really be faithful to you? And God says, I believe they will. And I will do everything for them. And God has invested everything in you believing that you will 
follow him by faith. In our last verse, I want to read from Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Here Jesus says to the church in Smyrna, Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you the devil will put some of you to prison to test you. And you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful even to the point of death. You got it. And I will give you life as a victor's crown. Or the King James says, I will give you the crown of life. That's your destiny. To be faithful unto death. To play it through through the fourth quarter. To the whistle blows, which is the trump of God. As we sing when the trump of God sounds, <laughs> sounds this is your destiny. So have faith in unseen things. That's our challenge. I want to end with a quote. During the darkest days of World War II, Winston Churchill emerged as a leader of Great Britain. He is known as one of the greatest political leaders of all time. Great Britain was being bombarded by Germany. The Blitzkrieg was upon them, and the British people saw little hope. And Hitler was offering, just give yourselves over to me, and it will be better. Just give yourself, surrender, like France did. Surrender. That's Satan talking. Give in, just give in, don't fight. But Churchill rose to the scene in British Parliament, and in one of his famous speeches, he said this to the struggling people of Great Britain. He said, you ask, what is our aim? I can answer in one word. It is victory. Victory at all cost. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory, however long and hard the road may be. For without victory, there is no survival. He nailed it. He says, we have no choice. We will not survive. Hitler's forces will be on our doorstep momentarily if we give in. And the same is true with our Christian life. Satan walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. When you give in to him, he's going to devour you and go on to somebody else. But don't. Your destiny is to be with God. Fight the battles. You're going to lose some. Get right back up. Keep trying. Keep fighting. Never give in. It's a daily struggle. And one day, your victory in Jesus will be realized. It may happen in your lifetime when you hear the trump of God call. And the dead in Christ shall rise. Or one day you'll be called from the ashes of death to meet the Lord. It's just a matter of when. Peter said the end is near. We are at the end of a war. You are close, and I am close. Let's stay the course in what God has invested in us. We're going to sing a song in just a minute to encourage us to continue that course, and that's why these assemblies are so important, because Satan is trying to pick us off one by one. He doesn't want us here. But let us encourage each other with this song. May us be strengthened to be faithful to God to commit ourselves to Him. We need to be committed in baptism. That's the beginning of finding that victory. But the rest of our life is spent recommitting to that decision we made to put ourselves in the Lord and be safe with Him. Safe in the arms of Jesus. There is no other place. There is no survival. There's no getting out of this world except through Jesus. Make sure you're staying the course today.